Uh, last time I talked, I started the contraction cycle, hadn't I? Uh, so let's, let's uh, review a little bit, and then we'll push through the end of it. Um, <clears throat> so at the beginning of uh, the... Con oh, are there any questions? I'm sorry, before I dive forward. Did anyone have any? Nope? Okay. Um, at uh, the beginning of a contraction cycle, calcium has been released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum through excitation-contraction coupling, as you may remember. Calcium is going to bind to the troponin and roll the tropomyosin off the active site of the actin filaments, the F-actin. Uh, once that happens, the uh, myosin head group is now free to form a cross bridge, to, to bind uh, to the actin. <clears throat> And as uh, that cross bridge is formed, that, that interaction that happens between actin and myosin uh, is the trigger to kick off the ADP, the ADP and the inorganic phosphate uh, from the previous ATP that had bound to the uh, head group are released. As that gets released, the ADP is sort of like the stopper in the, like the door jam or whatever that's keeping the the uh, spring-loaded door open, that uh, gets pulled out and the hinge region of the myosin is now free to release the pent-up energy that it has. Uh, and we have an actual contraction. I think this is where I left you guys last time. Um, <clears throat> so when that happens, when the, the, he the hinge region uh, springs forward, that causes, uh, that causes the part of the myosin head that uh, interacts with the actin filament to be in non-optimal orientation, and the cross bridge uh, then uh, falls <laughs> apart, right? The, the, as the energy is released, the cross bridge um, breaks apart. When that happens, having a, um, the unsprung unbound uh, head of the myosin is the ideal molecular confirmation for an ATP to come in and bind to the head group. So ATP is now free to move in and bind to the myosin head group. You can see how there's this uh, finely, uh, finely parsed series of molecular dominoes that's happening here. These are just cartoons uh, in, a, in a more uh, biochemically oriented <coughs> class, it'd be fun to look at this in uh, more molecular detail. It's pretty remarkable. Um, so when the ATP binds, uh, as it binds, uh, the, the head of the myosin is actually an ATPase. Uh, one, of its, one of its functions is as an ATP, and that's pri its primary function actually is an ATPase. Um, it will hydrolyze the ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate. In so doing, the energy that is released by the cleavage of the phosphodiester bond and ATP, uh, that energy um, is stored in the hinge. So as uh, the head group goes through the catalyt catalytic activity, uh, the ATPase activity, uh, it causes a conformational shift in the head group, which re Cox the, uh, the head group, all right? And you'll notice that this is exactly where we started at the beginning of the contraction cycle. Uh, so we're now ready to form a new cross bridge. Once the, the head has been cocked back, the uh, portion of the myosin head group uh, that binds to actin is in ideal alignment uh, to once again form a cross bridge uh, with the active site on F-actin. All right, and we just go through successive, uh, successive cycles of this until uh, one of a, a couple things happen. Uh, there's, there's really three things that can happen until calcium runs out, uh, right, until the calcium it diffuses off and is sequestered back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, <laughs> until we run out of ATP, or uh, we won't run out of room. There's no more road left. The, act, the muscle fiber gets fully contracted and can't really uh, contract any longer. All right. So um, those are uh, the conditions for termination of this contraction cycle. It'll just happen over and over again. Has anybody watched the, the little animation that I had in the, in the Moodle? No? Okay. Okay. 
So um, I had you guys up front here holding hands yesterday or Monday. Uh, and, oops, basically uh, trying to replicate this here, where you see that the sarcomeres, the, the Z lines, oops, the Z lines are going to move towards one another. They're going to move towards one another, and the sarcomere itself is going to shorten, essentially reducing the amount, the, the, uh, area of the um, of the I band, right? The I, the A band stays the same size because that's the myosin. The uh, I band is where it's just the actin, and that uh, gets shorter as the muscle contracts. <coughs> All right. So uh, I, I already said this, but uh, the contraction duration depends on the duration of the neural stimulus, how quickly. Uh, it does the synapse is the synapse able to reset itself, uh, meaning how rapidly is the acetylcholine able to diffuse off the acetylcholine receptor and the acetylcholine esterase recycle that? Um, how, so you know synapses have uh, different inherent uh, time constants uh, in terms of their function, right? So that's one thing that's going to affect the uh, contraction duration, and then uh, the next is how much calcium is actually available in the sarcoplasm, uh, in, in the cytosol of the, of the muscle cell. And then lastly, as I had uh, indicated, the availability of ATP. And we're going to talk about that. That's uh, the main point of the lecture, if I can get to it uh, today. I, I want to talk about sources of ATP, because that's really what muscle contraction is, is uh, fundamentally dependent upon. Um, all right, and then there's, of course, relaxation. I, I've already, uh, we start, talked about this a bit already. So the acetylcholine uh, is going to diffuse off of the uh, channel. And, you know, the, the first of all, the first thing that happens is, is the cessation of the neural stimulus. So there's no longer any degranulation at the uh, presynaptic terminal. The, the synaptic knob isn't going to be releasing the neurotransmitter any longer. And that's going to allow the acetylcholine to just diffuse off of the acetylcholine receptor at the postsynaptic terminal at the motor end plate. Um, and when that happens, there's this uh, enzyme called acetylcholine esterase that uh, cleaves the ester bond between the acetyl group and choline. Uh, we don't need to worry about the molecular details of that. Um, but uh, as that happens, that then allows that channel to close, and it's going to allow the um, membrane dynamics to reset. The uh, sodium-potassium ATPase is going to be able to uh, reset the uh, chemical gradient, um, and the voltage-gated uh, potassium channel is going to reset the, uh, the electrical gradient. So the electrochemical gradient is uh, going to return to the resting state. And as that happens, uh, the action potential is now over on the uh, surface of the sarcolemma. Uh, this, th so there are these uh, what are called constitutive, uh, constitutively active uh, calcium, yep, uh, calcium pumps that are constantly burning uh, ATP to pump calcium into the, uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum to, into the terminal <coughs> cisternum. As that happens, then calcium is going to diffuse away from uh, the troponin, and tropomyosin is going to roll back up onto the active site of the F-actin. You guys follow all that? It's just, it's just putting the dominoes up in reverse order, <coughs> setting it back up for a new uh, contraction cycle. So the, the, one of the, like, Important takeaways here is that ATP is needed for multiple steps in this process. We need it uh, at the um, sodium-potassium ATPase at the, uh, in the membrane and the sarcolemma. We need it for the um, calcium pumps in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We're going to need it to reset the uh, head groups on the myosin so that we can break Cross bridge formation. If there's not enough ATP in the cytosol uh, to to um, 
recock the head, then we're not going to be able to go through another uh, contraction cycle uh, if we get another neural stimulus. All right. So uh, once contraction is over, then we got to get the muscle back to its resting length. This is uh, often overlooked, but it's extremely important. And we'll see why uh, when I show you a diagram in a bit where I show you force versus uh, muscle length uh, relationship. So what are the there are three forces that are going to uh, act on getting the muscle back to the appropriate resting length? Those are the elastic forces. So there's a number of different elastic uh, elements that uh, surround a muscle fiber. These can be the tendons and ligaments, the connective tissue that surrounds the muscle fiber, pulling on the muscle fiber uh, to bring it back to its resting length. Um, and as a muscle fiber contracts, it is that the force of that contraction is doing a couple things. It is, yes, causing the muscle fiber to contract and, and uh, resulting in whatever uh, motion that the muscle is trying to elicit, right, whatever uh, specific force. But it's also a small amount of the force of that contraction is overcoming the elastic, inherent elastic forces of the tendons and the ligaments, the connective tissue around it. Um, so that, that's one uh, thing. The next is opposing muscle contractions. All right. So any muscle in the body um, that you can think of is really part of a muscle pair. Um, I don't, this is not an anatomy class, and even in an anatomy class, you'd have to dive in pretty deep. Um, although I'm thinking about teaching one, that, giving one in the fall, that would go into this. Um, talking about opposing muscle groups. Uh, so, for example, your bicep uh, tendon, the brachialis and the bicep, which uh, flexes uh, the forearm, the, the opposing muscle group is the tricep, uh, which uh, unflexes the arm. And, and in so doing that, it, it lengthens uh, the bicep. Right? And so most of the muscles, it's hard for me to think of a muscle in the body that isn't in an, uh, an oppositional uh, dichotomy with another uh, opposing muscle. Um, and then lastly... Uh, we're so lucky to be uh, on, on planet Earth with all of its gravity and, and all that Earth does for us. So um, gravity is certainly one of the things that helps uh, your muscles return to their resting, resting length. So I contract my muscles. I don't really need to let the triceps lengthen my arms. I can just let gravity do its uh, job. All right. So let's summarize all that. Um, I'm just going to sort of flash through it in one go so you can see, uh, so you can hear it. Uh, neural stimulus arrives at the synaptic knob, causing degranulation of the acetylcholine into the synaptic <laughs> cleft. Uh, acetylcholine binds the acetylcholine receptor on uh, the postsynaptic terminal at the motor end plate, uh, causing the channel to open, sodium to rush in. This triggers voltage-gated uh, sodium channels in the membrane, in the excitable uh, sarcolemma uh, membrane, which initiates an action potential that's going to spread across the uh, sarcolemma down into the T-tubules. The T-tubules are in close apposition to uh, the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum at the terminal cisterna in the triads. That's going to cause an opening of the uh, calcium receptor, uh, I'm sorry, the calcium channels in uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's going to release calcium into the sarcoplasm. Calcium will bind troponin. Troponin rolls tropomyosin off uh, the active group. We initiate contraction cycle, right, uh, which is essentially cross bridge formation, uh, release of the pent up energy. Uh, by the, the pivoting of the, cro uh, of the head group, um, and then uh, release of the ADP, uh, breaking cross-bridge formation, binding of a new ATP, and subsequent hydrolysis, recocking the head, and going through that cycle. Um, so that's, that's all the steps in muscle contraction. And then uh, when we, we go to relax, uh, the, the neural stimulus has ended, acetylcholine diffuses away from the acetylcholine receptor, acetylcholine esterase breaks it down, um, and um, the sodium-potassium ATPase, uh, the sodium-potassium pump, is going to reestablish the chemical gradient, um, 
and uh, then calcium is going to be resequestered by the calcium pumps into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, calcium diffuses off the actin filaments, and uh, contraction ends. Uh, various passive and active forces bring the muscle back to the uh, muscle fiber back to resting length. <coughs> That's all of it. <clears throat> Are there any questions on that on that sequence? I sort of blew through it there. All right, pretty pretty straightforward. A uh, lot of details, but. Rigor mortis. Uh, rigor mortis is a, a fixed muscular contraction that happens after death. Um, and what happens here in rigor mortis is that uh, the ion pumps that are in um, the muscle fibers, they don't have ATP. The cell is quiescent at this point. It's, it's dead. And so uh, it's metabolically inactive. It's not able to break down. It's not getting the oxygen it needs to be able to uh, have the mitochondria function and produce the ATP that it needs. Um, so uh, with, with the lack of ATP, these ion pumps seek, uh, cease to, to function properly. And as this happens... Uh, calcium is now no longer able to be uh, built up, uh, is no longer able to be stored or sequestered into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And because of that, it just stays there bound to the troponin. Calcium builds up in the sarcoplasm, in the cytosol. And uh, as that happens, there's, we've already established there's no ATP. The muscle cannot go through a contraction, but... Uh, the head group just binds to uh, the actin and doesn't go anywhere. So there's this uh, interaction between um, actin and myosin uh, with the absence of ATP that causes um, the sort of the, the rubber on the tires to stick to the road. All right, And so the muscle fiber is not able to lengthen or, or contract. And we have this... Uh, rigor mortis that sets in, a stiffening of the muscles. With time, uh, though, the, the cross bridge formation does break up and the body becomes a little bit more uh, loose. But uh, uh, soon after death, um, for maybe 24 hours or whatever, the body goes into <laughs> rigor mortis. Uh, all right, so tension production. Uh, in a... So we talked about action potentials uh, when we were talking about the cell physiology chapter. I talked about the all or none principle, right? You don't get like half an action potential. If you knock over the dominoes, they're all going to fall, right? Uh, and so since this is excitable tissue and we're eliciting an action potential on the surface of the sarcolemma, if you start one, you're all in. It's all or none principle. If you start uh, a muscle fiber contracting it's going to contract. It's going to contract as much as it possibly can. Um, and we're going to get to how you can control the intensity of contraction or tension that builds up in a whole muscle in a little bit. But in a single muscle fiber, it's either all on or not all on. And, and the gradation of uh, tension that a whole muscle elicits is a function of muscle fiber recruitment. How many muscle fibers in that muscle are you recruiting for any particular contraction? But we'll get there. Um, in a single muscle fiber, the tension that that muscle fiber can give you is, a depend is dependent on a couple of factors. First of all, the number of pivoting cross bridges. Um, it's just like uh, in Formula One racing. They have these super wide tires. Big engines, super wide tires, the more rubber that's on the road, the more force that engine is able to bring to bear on, uh, on the, the road. So the number of pivoting cross bridges, right? It's like the number of cylinders, I suppose, in the car or something. Um, and then the fiber's resting length at the time of stimulation. I'm going to show you what I find to be a pretty useful uh, slide in a moment. And this uh, means looking for the optimal length in the zone of overlap between thin and thick filaments. And then finally, uh, it's the frequency of stimulation. 
Okay, so the next several slides, I'm going to unpack each of these. Uh, the frequency of stimulation just means how uh, rapidly is that muscle fiber <laughs> being asked uh, to contract uh, subsequently. And uh, are, is the frequency so high that you're not allowing that muscle fiber to relax back to the resting length before you ask it uh, to contract again? And if so, you're going to uh, slowly increase uh, the total amount of tension that that muscle fiber is able uh, to deliver. All right, so here for any of the athletes in the room, uh, this is, I think, a pretty interesting uh, diagram. And uh, what we're looking at here is the, uh, along the x-axis, this is length of sarcomere, the sarcomere length. And um, in the y dimension, this is just the tension that a single muscle fiber can deliver. So what this shows us is that there is an optimal length in the zone of overlap an optimal length in the zone of overlap in terms of the amount of tension that it can deliver. So let's start down here. Um, this is a muscle fiber that is heavily contracted. Now, I, I'm sure that some of you have um, heard the term muscle bound before, a person who is muscle bound. Uh, this would be, for example, someone who has done a lot of weight training and their body, they've gotten these giant muscles uh, but they're actually pretty inflexible. You, you see them, they kind of, you know, walk around like this. Muscle bound means that those muscles have been contracted so profoundly that, um, <coughs> that there's nowhere for the muscles to go any longer. That even though they have a huge muscle density, uh, they don't have, uh, an individual muscle fiber cannot deliver very much, uh, tension because there's just no what they can't the muscle fibers cannot contract any further right there's just no more room for that muscle fiber uh, to slide um, it's just to slide over one another on the other end of the scale this would be a muscle that is essentially on the verge of being torn right it's been lengthened to such a point that there's no rubber on the road at all this would be like driving um, this would be like driving a Formula One uh, car with like uh, racing tires from a from a bicycle or something like that, like you know you know a ten speed bike or something. So there's just not very much uh, interaction between the pivoting crossheads uh, on the myosin and the actin track. Maybe a few or maybe none in in a totally uh, torn muscle in a, in a dysfunctional muscle. So uh, then you can see this. Uh, this spectrum here. And this is where most people are. Perhaps this would be uh, athletes who, who actually don't do very much stretching. And maybe this is uh, a yogi who is overly stretched or something. I don't know. Uh, or maybe somebody who, who tore a muscle. That is, I, I'm, I'm not trying to diss on yogi one myself. But um, <clears throat> the point here is that if you are an athlete and you want to get more performance, you want to get more power out of your muscles without adding any muscle density at all, seek the optimal resting length of the muscle. This is why stretching is so important. Uh, it's so important. Without adding any more muscle mass, you can get more performance out of the same muscle just by getting that muscle uh, to the appropriate length. Uh, this is why having... Uh, a, a balanced stretching regime uh, is so important in, in tandem with any kind of weight training uh, that, uh, that you may be doing uh, so that you're getting the most out of it. Yeah, Zoe. That, that's a good question. Um, there, are, there are more um, quantitative ways about going about that, but there's also qualitative uh, ways, just keeping track of uh, the the uh, the max capacity that a particular muscle group can give, and then going through a, a stretching program uh, over the course of you know several several weeks and and charting uh, the output of that without adding any particular amount of muscle mass uh, to that group, just keeping the group at the same um, baseline. So yeah, all right. Um, 
I, I do want to move on. This is interesting, but uh, are there any other questions? Okay. So um, just to like state the obvious here so that I can move into the less obvious, uh, there, there are essentially three phases of a twitch. What we're calling a twitch is the entire process of a muscle fiber getting stimulated and going through the excitation, excitation, contraction, coupling, and contraction, and then finally uh, relaxation. All of that is called a twitch. Um, <clears throat> so the three phases are, are rest, when you're at rest, um, and then um, when you're at rest, stimulus arrives at the rest. There's this latent period here, and it's pretty short. Uh, it's a pretty short time, just a few milliseconds, very short period of time that a millisecond, uh, to remind you, is a one one thousandth of a second, just a few of them, two or three milliseconds, is all of the time that it takes uh, between initial arrival of the neural stimulus at the synaptic knob and uh, cross bridge formation. So I'm not going to go through all those things again, but you've heard them today. All of those steps uh, take a few milliseconds. Once that happens, that's the end of the resting phase. We enter contraction uh, where we're building up tension in uh, the muscle fiber until uh, there's the end of the neural stimulus and uh, we begin the relaxation phase and the tension uh, abates. All right, so rest, uh, rest, contraction, relaxation. Um, all right, now this uh, a, a twitch, the length of this process uh, can vary widely depending upon what muscle in the body we're talking about. Uh, it can last anywhere from less than 10 milliseconds, uh, in, for example, in an eye muscle to um, a tenth of a second in a uh, muscle, for example, in the, in the soleus, uh, which is the deep muscle of the calf. Um, and uh, if you want sustained muscular contraction, you're going to lift something and just hold it. Uh, that's going to take, that's going to require uh, successive muscle contractions. It's going to contract, release, contract, release, contract, release, in concert with other muscle contractions uh, in uh, the same, uh, in, in conjunction with other muscle fiber contractions within the same whole uh, fascicle or muscle. All right. And, you know, um, we'll get to why the eye, um, on, on the physiological scale here, we'll, we'll get to why the eye and the soleus are a little different from one another, I hope. Uh, but you can just rationalize it um, from a functional perspective. You're not running a race with your eyes, right? You just need to make sure that like you don't get hit in the head with a snowball or something. So your eye needs to move quickly uh, in, in one direction. It's speed is what is important uh, with the, an eye muscle. Whereas the muscle of the calf, you know, a, a tenth of a second is, is plenty fast enough uh, for the, the muscle of the calf to be able to do what it does, which is help you to run, help you to run. And what's more important there is actually the way in which the muscle of the calf burns energy, right? So that the eye muscle does not need to be a particularly aerobically tuned muscle. It just needs to respond quickly. Whereas the soleus uh, functionally is, it requires more aerobic capacity. All right, so that's going to require some discussion of the energetics of all this. But before I get there, uh, we need to give you a few definitions. So I said that the, the maximum tension um, in a muscle fiber is dependent upon the frequency of contraction, didn't I? Amongst other things, like the number of cross bridges that can form. And I talked about that in terms of the zone of overlap. So the number of cross bridges is a function of the resting length, but also the tension is dependent upon the frequency of contraction. Uh, so this is that concept. Um, the first idea here is trape, a trape. So um, say we have some sort of contraction that happens and we allow it uh, to relax and there's, we hit a certain frequency of contraction 
it's going to lead to a, a certain uh, a a slow increase in uh, tension in the muscle fiber uh, that's going to reach some sort of maximum tension. That tension, given that frequency, is less than the maximal tension that the muscle fiber can achieve. It's just the maximal tension that it can uh, achieve with trepe. Trepe being this stair step increase in twitch uh, tension. It just is due to repeated uh, stimulation immediately after the relaxation phase. Now, if we increase that uh, frequency of contraction to the point of the tail, the tail of uh, the previous contraction overlapping with the front end of the uh, successive contraction, then we can get this what's called wave summation. And that's when the tension begins to build significantly uh, in the muscle fiber. All right, so repeated stimulation before the end of the relaxation phase. Um, so in wave summation, we're going to get to uh, a point of what's called incomplete tet tetanus. These, uh, the muscle fiber is going to <laughs> achieve a level of maximal tension um, that is less than the, uh, the, the absolute maximum uh, that is possible. And then uh, complete tetanus happens when the frequency of stimulation is so rapid that neuron is, is trying to fire that muscle uh, so profoundly that uh, the contraction phase of uh, a successive uh, contraction stimulation it has crossed the threshold into the contraction phase of the previous. All right, so it's just this uh, fluid increase uh, in the in the tension until we reach complete tetanus. The muscle uh, never begins to relax. It's in continuous contraction. This is not sustainable uh, for a very long period of time. Complete tetanus in a muscle fiber rapidly uh, decays as the muscle fiber exhausts itself. All right, so incomplete and complete tetanus, trepe and wave summation. All right, so <clears throat> um, I already said this, but the tension production in a whole muscle is going to depend on a number of things, uh, particularly, specifically, the number of motor, what are called motor units that are going to be recruited. So here's a, a cross-section of a spinal cord, and these are motor neurons. These are efferent neurons, the kind of neurons that turn on muscles, the kind of neurons that terminate with synaptic knobs that release acetylcholine. They're cholinergic neurons. Um, and each neuron is going to uh, control what's called a motor unit, and that's a group of... Um, muscle fibers within a particular fascicle. It's going to recruit a, a group of them such that, um, so, so I guess before that, uh, the, the structure of a neuron, we said there's the axon that then branches into the telodendria with uh, all of these different synaptic knobs on the end of the arborization of the telodendria. It's those uh, multiple uh, the multiple branches in the telodendria that represent the arborization of the, the motor uh, unit. All right, so multiple, when a single neuron fires, all of the muscle fibers in that motor unit are going to contract. All right, um, and so let's look at the diagram here. We have motor unit one, the, the orange uh, neuron stimulates all of the muscle fibers in that motor unit. Uh, and it generates some tension, and then that neuron re, uh, relaxes, and the tension goes down. However, uh, a different motor unit is going to begin to come on uh, a little bit into the time course here. And the red line is the overall tension that the tendon of that muscle feels. So it's a combination, it's this sort of cascading combination of... Uh, 
motor units that act in concert. If you need more tension in the muscle, then you're going to recruit more motor units and the frequency uh, between the initiation, that, that time between initiation of different motor units will get shorter, right? Or if you need less tension in the muscle, uh, fewer motor units will be recruited and uh, the lag between initiation of different motor units will be larger, all right? This is all pretty straightforward and intuitive. Well, okay, I've got 12 minutes to get through uh, ATP. I don't know. We'll see what I do. Let's see what I get to. This is important. So I've already hopefully uh, shown you that all muscle contraction is importantly dependent upon ATP. And uh, the ability of the muscle cells to produce ADP is going to uh, be dependent on two things. First of all, uh, it needs some kind of energy source. That is a carbon source, an organic uh, energy source, like glucose, for example, uh, or a fatty acid of some sort. Um, and then, uh, ideally, oxygen as well. There's going to need to be uh, some kind of an oxygen source. So really, this is just combustion. All the energy our bodies get, our bodies are truly like controlled fires. We have a little cellular fire in all of our cells. Um, it is the exact same uh, overall chemical equation as uh, burning a log in a fireplace. Uh, here's the carbon source. Carbon source gets oxidized uh, and released as carbon dioxide. Uh, you eat a carbon source, you breathe in oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide. Um, most of you probably are already aware of that, but uh, some people are, are always kind of uh, amazed when they realize that all of the food that you eat and absorb, that carbon, you are breathing it out. You are breathing out the carbon that you eat, which is pretty cool. All right. So here, uh, let's begin the, with the phosphagen system. So... <clears throat> Uh, the phosphagen system provides energy for motion, um, and there are different. When you think about uh, the energetic requirements that a muscle fiber needs, there are different time windows on that. Right? There are different time windows on that. Sometimes you need uh, a muscle fiber <laughs> or a muscle to be able to have a quick burst of power, just a short burst of power. Or sometimes you need sustained activity, right? Um, and the energetic needs of those two are very distinct, and we have different mechanisms for dealing with them. The phosphagen system is energy for short bursts, all right? Short time periods of uh, extreme energy requirement, all right? So um, the first is uh, creatine, and any, any bodybuilder is, is, is probably familiar with creatine. Um, what happens with creatine, creatine is this nitrogen containing uh, organic compound here that I'm not going to expect that you uh, are able to draw, but I want you to see it uh, because uh, this enzyme that I have in the bottom here, creatine phosphokinase, CPK, uh, catalyzes the addition of, it's a kinase, a kinase is an enzyme that adds a <coughs> phosphoryl group, uh, a phosphorus group to, a, um, to an, a, an another entity, uh, CPK adds a phosphate to creatine. And the reason we do this is uh, it's super easy to pull that phosphate out of creatine phosphate rapidly. Say we burn a bunch of ATP, we have a bunch of ADP sitting around, we can have uh, creatine phosphate quickly phosphorylate ADP to ATP. So it's like a phosphate reserve. It's a, it's a labile phosphate reserve. Does that make sense? Okay, creatine phosphate. This is why bodybuilders like it because it gives you, um, it's good for anaerobic activity. It gives you a burst of ATP without requiring oxygen. There's no oxygen here, is there? Good anaerobic source. Um, all right, here's another one. 
Here's an enzyme uh, called myokinase or adenylate kinase, uh, ADK. ADK is a little bit different. It tries to squeeze, to wring the most phosphate out of the, um, out of, uh, the ADP that's already there. So what it does, it takes, myokinase takes two ADP. Say we burnt a bunch of ATP. It takes two ADP and transfers an inorganic phosphate from one to the other. So we end up with AMP, which is no more or less useful than an ADP to the cell, and, but we get one ATP out of it. All right? So myokinase, that's another part of the phosphagen system, the system that our muscle cells have uh, for storing phosphoryl groups, phosphoryl energy. Right, for rapid for rapid release. This is not a, a long-term strategy for sustained contraction, all right? but it's short-term bursts of, of energy that a cell might need. Uh, okay, on to aerobic metabolism. Um, so to begin with, let's talk about a muscle cell at rest. A muscle cell at rest. Uh, hopefully, you've all had breakfast. Who had breakfast today? Oh, good. Or at least some sort of thing. Some sort of thing. Keep your, your body perked up. Um, <clears throat> so you should have, you should be in uh, the absorptive state right now. And uh, the glucose that's circulating in your blood vessels and the fatty acids that are circulating in your blood uh, are going to enter your muscle cells uh, along with whatever oxygen because uh, you, your body is able to meet the oxygen requirement uh, that it has by, by just sitting there. So first, uh, glucose enters and is going to be stored as glycogen. You're not you don't really need to burn uh, that glucose right now because your body is not being called upon uh, for sustained uh, energetic output. Um, so the glucose gets stored as glycogen. And glycogen, I already said this uh, in a previous class, is just a, uh, what is that? Starch. It's like animal starch. Uh, it's just a storage molecule that's a long chain of alpha-1,4 linked uh, glucose with some alpha-1,6 uh, branching in it, glycogen. Um, and that actually takes a little bit of ATP to form glycogen, to store all this glucose. We're getting that ATP by burning fat. You actually, uh, as you sit there, the energy that your cells are actually burning is coming from the fat that's being absorbed uh, and oxidized through what's called beta oxidation. Um, Sadly, I won't have a chance to talk about that, but I think they talk about that in biochem. Yeah, beta oxidation, you remember that? Okay, anyways, uh, mitochondria take up these fatty acids and uh, absorb oxygen, oxidize the carbon in the fat, and the byproduct is CO2, and pumps out a bunch of this ATP. We use this ATP to form glycogen and uh, to store some of the phosphorus as creatine phosphate, all right? So this is, this is rest. You're just putting it in the bank, so to speak. Next, uh, aerobic metabolism at moderate activity. We're going for a jog. We're gonna go for a nice, easy jog. Could do this all day long. Um, so at this point, uh, we need a higher ATP yield than uh, what's required at rest, right? Uh, when you're at rest, you're just trying to uh, make glycogen and store uh, phosphate in, in, in creatine. However, now uh, the fatty acids that we were burning are still getting burned by mitochondria, uh, but we need more than that. So we're going to start uh, mobilizing the glycogen reserves in the muscle fibers. We're going to start burning off the glycogen. Glycogen breaks down uh, to glucose, uh, 
And then glucose goes through a process called glycolysis, which we will see in a little bit more detail. Who's had glycolysis before? Yeah, all of you. Okay, great. Most of you. Uh, glucose goes through by glycolysis, breaks down to two, uh, three carbon fragments of pyruvic acid. Glucose is a six carbon uh, molecule. And glycolysis actually is not a super uh, productive way to make ATP. You only get two ATP for every glucose molecule you burn. Uh, but once that pyruvic acid hits those dynamos in the mitochondria, uh, the pyruvic acid gives rise to 34 ATP uh, through uh, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Who's had that stuff before? All of you. Great. Okay. So this is all review. <clears throat> Uh, pretty pretty efficient way of making ATP. Now, uh, anaerobic metabolism, peak activity. Um, our body is now no longer able to deliver enough oxygen for the aerobic processes. And it's still going on. The aerobic metabolism is going on in the background, but it's not able to meet our uh, energetic needs. All right? And... We sort of, uh, I guess, glycolysis, the pace of glycolysis outstrips the um, ability of your body to deliver oxygen to the cells uh, to break the pyruvic acid down. We've reached what's called VO2 max. VO2 max. Who's heard of the word VO2 max before? Most of you. Good. VO2 max is just... Uh, how much the, the maximal volume of oxygen that your cardiovascular system can deliver at any given time. So, um, so we're left with this anaerobic metabolism, which is essentially uh, central metabolism glycolysis. Uh, not a very efficient way uh, to utilize the glucose, um, but it's, it's hopefully rapid and for a short uh, bursts. This is when we begin to pull the creatine phosphate out of uh, the phosphate out of storage in the creatine phosphate um, for, for rapid uh, use of ATP. The outcome of this, without getting into the molecular details, is uh, a lot of lactic acid can build up. Uh, it's a molecular byproduct of uh, pyruvic acid. All right. So... Yeah, that's the, the witching hour.